Thanks for joining me today on Veterans Chronicles. My guest is Edmund Jaskowitz. He is a World War II veteran, uh, Army veteran, who took part in the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos. Um, but we'll get to that later. Let's start with uh, the beginning. Uh, where were you born and raised? <clears throat> I was born in uh, Norwich, Connecticut, June, July 5th, 1923. When attended all the local schools, grammar schools, went to the NFA, the high school, same as what Ted did. <laughs> and uh, after high school, I uh, went to the uh, University of Connecticut, where I en enrolled in the mechanical engineering major. What inspired you to study mechanical engineering? Well, I liked it. <laughs> I just liked engineering and doing things like that. And I, I, I just couldn't see the idea of going to college and studying a lot of liberal arts courses that <laughs> whereas I was pretty sure that if I studied engineering I wouldn't have any difficulty getting a job when I got out and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine so. But, but I liked engineering. I always liked this stuff like that. So your um, your education was disrupted. The what? Your education was disrupted due, That's to, right. due to the war. That's right. Um, was there a history of service in your family? Or were you the first to serve? No, my father was in the veteran of the First World War. Um, he was, um, well, <laughs> near as I could get out of him, he could drive, he drove a fire truck. In those days, not that many people had driver's licenses. And so he was one of the few that had a license. So his job was to drive a fire truck. And actually, he was stationed at Curtis Bay, you know, up in Baltimore. <laughs> so. That, that's about all I could get out of him but in military service. <laughs> so he didn't talk about it much? <laughs> no. didn't talk about it much, no. And, and I, just, I just wasn't interested enough either. We'd ask him once in a while uh, different questions, and that's all he would say. Oh, we did say one time somebody took him for, for, up for a uh, flight in the airplane because there was an air base there at Curtis Bay. So he did, but that, that's about all. Okay. So uh, where were you when Pearl Harbor happened? Where was I when Pearl Harbor happened? Let's see what was. When Pearl Harbor happened, I was at home, and I just about finished dinner. And I remember getting on the radio and hearing about this stuff, Pearl Harbor. And this was early in the afternoon, 1 or 2 o'clock. And I was home because I came home almost every other weekend. And then my parents would drag me uh, uh, would, would drive me either back to the university or they would part way, uh, actually past the Antic, and then you'd stand there and hitchhike. And those days, hitchhiking was pretty common. <laughs> and you never had any problem getting a ride. So uh, then I got to school and we went down to the, um, about dinner time, went to the dining hall, and of course everybody was talking about it. But there was not too much great agitation. It was very interesting. Everybody recognized it and all that. and. We're at war and all that, but you know, in the atmosphere of the university, it's, it didn't bother us yet. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's where I was. Okay, so you didn't feel the urgency to necessarily, uh, just, just yet, you didn't necessarily feel urgency about being at war just yet. No, 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 no. The only urgency came was in <laughs> during that first semester. A lot of guys were dropping out, <laughs> and I remember one guy, they joined the Army, they had an Army Reserve Corps there, and they signed up in the Army Reserve because they said, well, you won't be called up for a while. The strangest thing happened, he signed up because they called call away the same semester, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, a lot of guys started disappearing. That, that's, uh, some of them signed up and some were, were drafted. So you were drafted in 44, July of 44, July, correct? Yeah. What were your thoughts upon being drafted? What, I, what were your thoughts upon being drafted? What a crock. <laughs> <laughs> I say that because I was in my last semester at, this, at the school, and all I had to do was just finish out that semester, and I would have been it. So I had half, half the semester, and, I, you know, I got the... Passed the exam and all that, and so a report for induction on July 20th, 1944, which we did. And we've, we 
We put down, we got together down in the town of Norwich, the hometown, and then they took us by bus down to New Haven. We were at the armory down in New Haven, Connecticut, where we were actually inducted into the army. From then on, we then we took a bus and they sent us up to Fort, I'm pretty sure we went by bus up to Camp Devons, or Fort Devons, and it's right outside of Boston. That I remember my father would tend to Fort, uh, was at Fort Devons also. <laughs> really? So, uh, so you went to basic training in uh, Camp Croft, South Carolina, correct? Yeah, we spent uh, uh, about two weeks at the Devons there, and then I was transferred down to Camp Croft, uh, South Carolina. Camp Crotch, as we used to call it. It's Camp Croft, is Spartanburg, <laughs> Spartanburg, South Carolina, for basic training infantry. And you were training to go to Europe. Correct. You were training for combat. And what? Uh, you were training for combat. Correct. You weren't. Well, everybody took basic training. Right. They, 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 they trained for combat. That's correct. Everybody took the same basic training. So it wasn't until uh, February of 45 that you were assigned to Los Alamos, correct? <laughs> well, we should back up a little bit. Well, we're in the service, uh, uh, infantry, uh, Camp Croft. There was a notice that came around said if anybody wants to apply for uh, advanced training, I mean army training at college, go to attend the college, you should show up and take these exams on the weekend. So uh, comes I signed up for it, and then comes the weekend I, you know, take these exams. Well, my buddies are all saying, "What a waste of time! What a crock!" I said, "Well, you could be out drinking beer instead of taking an exam or something like that." But anyway, I took the I took the exam, so, and then we got got the word that uh, okay, you passed. I remember my score was 130, and 130 was in the army very high. <laughs> that was supposed to be army IQ, so so I was picked and somebody else, and we uh, got, uh, got then and we got our orders to go to uh, uh, what the hell did we go? Well, let's see from there. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Then we went to uh, uh, North Carolina State. But the interesting thing is that my mother was quite perturbed that here I was in the infantry. So, I don't know if I've told you guys the story, but in the infantry, and she writes the letter to some general or somebody. I don't know who, who she wrote to, but uh, she got an answer back in a while and says, well, you don't have to worry, ma'am. He's not going to be in the infantry. He's going to be transferred out to go to college. And so she knew before I did. <laughs> and then I got the word that I, had, that I was going to be transferred out and go to college, ASTP. So she must have been relieved. <laughs> well, she was, yeah. <laughs> um, what, were, what were your thoughts upon learning that you would be taking a different route than necessarily engaging? Like what? What were your thoughts upon learning that instead of you know going to Europe and, and uh, yeah, well, fighting over there, that you'd be well, engaging I, in a different kind of warfare? Yeah, well, I thought, well, this, this may, may be more interesting, you know, and uh, uh, to go to school. And besides, I could at least finish up my uh, <laughs> engineering training, which I did, because in, in the Army, uh, I, had, I attended eight semesters of college, and so as far as they're concerned, I was an engineer, graduate engineer, even though I didn't have a degree, but I was an engineer. And so that was put me in a different class classification. My classification was engineering aid, not, not infantrymen or anything like that, but engineering aid. So that to me was a big deal. <laughs> I, I think, uh, I believe Ted had mentioned that had you not been selected for to study engineering, you would have um, eventually gone to Europe and fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, did um, any of your... Well, that's interesting because that's what happened to most of the guys I was with. I found out later on that they were all sent over uh, to the Battle of the Bulge. In fact, some of the guys didn't even get any leave. Usually, when you uh, finish your basic training, they gave you leave, usually pretty good leave, 30 days or so, then you go back. But a lot of these guys didn't even get the 30-day leave. They just sent them all over to the Battle of the Bulge. So I have a couple minutes before the end of our first segment here. So um, 
after spending after spending time at North North Carolina studying engineering. One um, semester. One semester. You spent another two weeks in Oak Ridge, and then you were assigned uh, to Los Alamos. That's correct. Um, Tell me about some characters that you met at Los Alamos. The what? Uh, some characters that you met at Los Alamos. <laughs> okay, they're all characters. <laughs> uh, well. well, I mostly uh, buddied around with this guy by the name of Mike Olson. And Mike was a, uh, he was from Maine. And he, actually, he was in the regular army. He was stationed out in Panama before the war. And then he came back to Maine, and he was uh, he worked as a guide and that sort of thing, a real outdoors guy, a good beer drinker. So we, you know, we just b b chummed around with him, and uh, well, we did a lot of things together. And there were other other guys in the group. I can't remember the name, but I, you know, I just remember the person. Uh, but uh, there's a, one little character from Chicago I remember, Little Al. And uh, he was a real tough, tough little cookie from South Side Chicago, South Side of <laughs> Chicago. And I often wonder what happened to him. When I went out to uh, to um, Los Alamos, we traveled with a group of six of us, uh, all engineers, and, and then we came out there. But once I got out there, I, I never saw much of these guys. They they were all assigned to, to different places, you know. And, so uh, I was, uh, I remember coming in for an orientation meeting and right after I got there and I was talking to the, this young second lieutenant, you know, and, and he says, okay, he says, I got only two things to tell you. One, <clears throat> we're making an atomic bomb here. Two, you cannot be sent into combat after you've been here. So, <laughs> well, I tell you, this isn't bad. <laughs> so, uh, they assigned me to the, I was sent to a DP site, which didn't mean anything to me at the time, but it went to DP site, but it turned out that this is where the final assembly of the bomb was going to take place. And, uh, all right, and we'll hear more about that um, when we come back for our okay, next segment. Okay, all right, whatever. My, um, this is Megan Maggi. I'm talking with Edmund Jaskowitz. Um, he's a U.S. Army veteran who worked on the atomic bomb. We'll hear more when we come back on Veterans Chronicles. Thanks for joining me today on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Megan Maggi, talking with Edmund Joskowitz, U.S. Army veteran of World War II. Uh, we're just talking about his time in Los Alamos, where he was aware he was building the bomb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, as you were saying during our break, um, pe people didn't really talk about um, what you, they were doing when they were state. You stationed. never never asked another guy what he what he did. I mean, you, you might say, "What do you do in work or something?" Oh, I'm I'm a building so and so. I'm b building so and so. After a while, you got to know which buildings did what things. And so you figure if you got in that building, you're uh, you're doing this. For example, they had an S site. An S site was where they cast all the explosives. And so somebody was stationed at S site, you got a pretty good idea what they were doing. Um, but it was just a general idea, and you just, just didn't talk about it. And especially they told you when you go into town, you go down to Santa Fe, and you, don't, you better watch it, don't get to, uh, have uh, too much to drink and get a loose tongue. And if somebody starts asking you questions about what you're doing and all that, we had a standard answer. You know what we're doing up at the hill? We're making windshield wipers for submarines. And then we take the submarines and shove them in the tunnel all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> but, but usually they'll get the message. <laughs> so you had an answer. <laughs> you had an answer, buddy. <laughs> um, and uh, I just have to tell you that uh, uh, one guy apparently talked a little too much down there. And so um, he got, came back to the base. But the next morning, he was no longer there. <sighs> And we were told ahead of time that uh, you do too much talking, take you right out of here. So this other guy, he come in at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I thought it was they said FBI, but it could be the uh, criminal intelligence thing. Came in, packed up all the stuff, and took him. And that was it. Nobody never heard from him again. <laughs> so uh, you you first were assigned to the DP site. That's um, correct. What kind of work did you do there? 
Well, I tell you, <laughs> the main job that I, I did there was working on the cast pieces of explosive. They would cast these uh, explosives into a shape, and we call them, they called them lenses. <laughs> and they would cast them into a shape so that they could assemble them around a, a central sphere, which is about two feet in diameter, which, where all the hot stuff was. And so they assembled two layers of these ex uh, explosives around this uh, sphere. And so I, uh, I remember vividly taking those lenses and you, you very carefully, you couldn't have any nicks or chips or anything out of it because if they did, they'd throw it out. And so you'd be very careful, you'd take it, and we used to tape all the faces, the side faces, not the, not the inner and outer faces, but the side faces with a cloth that looked like a pool table cloth. In fact, that we, it probably was, but to us, I mean, it was, this is a pool table cloth. <laughs> and so you have to tape that on carefully on a, in a certain way and not, uh, not uh, make any chips or breaks. If you break the explosive, they would just throw it into a se separate uh, uh, container. So I continue on this thing, because it was very interesting. They had a lot of scrap explosive. And they keep storing this stuff, so they decided one time we better get rid of this scrap stuff. So they made an announcement: we're going to take this scrap stuff and we're going to put it all together in a big pile and we're going to detonate it, get rid of it. So everybody knew about it, and so we went up there, and the, the time came they set it off. Jesus, I said, mean, it's a b bigger explosion than anybody ever thought. Shook the ground, and everybody thought the S site had blew up, <laughs> blown up. <laughs> so they, everybody enjoyed the explosion, but the high command decided we better make smaller piles of explosives the next time. <laughs> so you, so you witnessed some of the the original testing. Um, well, uh, the actual testing I did not. But I did pre help to prepare um, the place. What, at Adam Magordo, they had built this tower. And uh, they wanted to make a, a test ahead of time to see how the explosion would be. So we were sent down there to uh, stack up these explosives uh, in a certain way. And I think there's about 100 tons of explosive that we had to stack, stack it up. And it came to us in boxes. And then we had to unload the box from the truck, you know, and everybody would just, what the hell they call it, just carry it along, you know. So after a while, you know, it gets a little dull, you know. We'd, one guy would take the case, and he'd throw it to the other guy, and they'd throw it to the next guy. And a couple of the officers around there said, well, you know, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And I said, you want to get the job done, don't you? So we kept, just kept throwing it. Pretty soon the officers disappeared. We never saw them again. <laughs> and so we just kept unloading the way we were unloading. <laughs> just about one more minute before we take our next break. Um, so after after DP site, you were assigned to S site, which was the explosive um, explosive site you were talking about. Um, what? How was that work? That, that in there you were actually building explosives, correct? Well, the, the, you jump ahead quite a bit. I mean, if you want to do it that way, that's, that's all right with me. But, you know, we finally finished assembly of the bomb and uh, had everything on there, uh, all explosive, and we had what we called the harness. The harness consisted of all the wires, one single wire going to each lens, and then the, the connected the detonator. Now, the wires, each wire was the same length. Even if the lens, no matter where the lens was, it had to be the same length so they'd all go off at the same time. <laughs> and so they jammed it all in there. And, and I remember they, we assembled it. And then we clamped the halves of the bomb together. And that's when several of us signed our names on the front of the, uh, the bomb. And you know, everybody was trying to think of some smart comment, but uh, I, I just signed my name and that's all. And then... Uh, the bomb was uh, shipped out. Uh, this is the big one. Now. I saw the little one, the, the thin man. They had it there when I first came in. In fact, they showed me to her when they had the orientation. Uh, he showed me this in the box. This is a thin man. This is going to be shipped out now. Next. And then the fat man, the big one that I worked on, 
that was shipped out again. When that was shipped out, then I got to leave and I went home. And I'm back to Connecticut and people say, well, how long is this war going to last? I said, it'll be over in 30 days. <laughs> and they looked at me, how do you know? I said, it'll be over in 30 days. <laughs> and we knew that once the bomb got out there, they'd drop it. And <laughs> that would be, going to be the beginning of the end. So you, yeah, you knew. Um, we, yeah. We'll, we'll get back to more of this on our next segment. I'm okay. Megan Maggi talking with Edmund Joskowitz. U.S. Army veteran who worked on the atomic bomb here on Veterans Chronicles. Thanks for joining me today on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Megan Maggi. My guest is Edmund Jauskowitz, World War II Army veteran who um, spent some time in Los Alamos working on the Manhattan Project. And earlier we um, were briefly talking about testing, testing uh, right. the, the fat man, the, the bigger one, as well as the smaller smaller explosives. Um, did you want to talk more about that in your experience? Yeah, actually, see, we, we set up the explosives uh, 100 tons of explosive, and they, they wanted to uh, see what the what it would be like. So they they did. I, I wasn't there. After we assembled it, they, the, the brains got down there and assembled it and uh, exploded. So they were all right. Then they said, okay, now it's time for us to explode, to try the atomic, the first bomb, the actual atomic bomb. So that, that went off in July, I think, about 16th or something like that. And so they, they set that one off. And that was a little different. <laughs> I didn't go down there for that, but a couple of my guys from my group were down there. And uh, after the bomb, sometime after they had the bomb went off and things had kind of cooled down a bit, they went out and they walked on the actual site where the bomb was right up ahead. And they said the sand was all fused together, like green. And it looked just like a broken beer bottle, you know, <laughs> that, that, that green glass all around. So naturally, guys being what they are, broke off a few pieces, you know, and take them as a souvenir. So, so they did. And uh, I heard from about this one guy that after a while, when he got home, he found he had a, something with his leg on his thigh. It was kind of looked like a burn. He wondered what the hell it was. Then it dawned on him. He, he carried that piece of uh, radioactive sand around in his pocket and it caused a burn to his leg. <laughs> so <laughs> they got rid of it. <laughs> he got rid of it pretty fast. <laughs> and I don't know what, I, it probably happened in other places too, but I didn't hear about any other ones. But I, I just know about that one guy. I would imagine as, you know, with the first testing, people were still learning about the side effects and potential radioactivity and, yeah. and um, it's, since it was so new. Yeah, and you just want to, you want a souvenir for this, so you get a souvenir. <laughs> you got a souvenir. That definitely left a mark. So, um, so, so you didn't witness the, the, um, the test. No, the I did not test. witness the test. But, um, so what else was life, what was life like on the base um, and while you were building the, the bomb and just... And, and what, what? What was life like on the base um, oh, at Los Alamos? Oh. Well, otherwise you lead a pretty good life. Uh, life was pretty easy. I forget, uh, my site was located not in the downtown area. Downtown area, I mean. In Los Alamos, they had what they call a tech area. The tech area was all completely wired off, high security, a lot of buildings were in the, in the thing, a lot of administrative stuff was in there. Our site was out a little ways, but not as far as S site. In my book, the little, you see pictures of S site, but S site was uh, was far away, and so we drove around a while. We had we, the, the free use of the vehicles and all that. And uh, one time, we decided to go up and see the Valle Grande. Now, the Valle Grande was a um, not a crater from a volcano, but a, a crater from quite a few volcanoes. So we had to drive up this cruddy old road, and because we had a four-wheel drive army trucks, you know, so no problem. So we drive up to the top, and uh, you get there, stand on the edge, and you look down in this great big valley, you know, several miles across, and but the grass was as green as ever, and in there was cows grazing on that green grass. Some some guy owned it. I forget what it is, just a Spanish name, but he owned all that stuff and he had it he raised cattle in there so but the, the, the ride up there was really something i remember one time we got some new guys and and so we're driving along say hey, you guys want to go up there 
uh, Via Grande. Oh, sure, they didn't know what the hell it was. <laughs> so he drove up. But the ride on that road was really something. They, 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 <laughs> they, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> and, but, but that was all part of the game. And then, uh, then you go to the, uh, drink beer at the PX. I think beer was 10 cents a can. <laughs> and, so, and then once a month they had enough money so they would cut it down to a nickel a can. And so you go down there with a half a dollar and then you, <laughs> you can get a pretty good buzz on. <laughs> certainly different than today. Oh, certainly. <laughs> and then they would different tape guy, they had four or six people at a table, you know, in booth, and they would take the cans and they would stack them. They would stack them in all kinds of pyramids and all that. Well, there's always some wise guy say, hey, I'm going to take a can, he'd throw it to the next table, knock the pyramid down, <laughs> and then the fight started. <laughs> now, they didn't really fight because the MPs were right there, but they, <laughs> they heard a lot of bad language and stuff, and, and everybody else laughing like hell. <laughs> So you still had some fun, or managed to have fun while, oh, we had uh, while a lot working, of fun. <laughs> while we, working uh, or after so we had, time. We had a movie theater, and the movie theater was quite good because we get first-run movies there. As soon as they release from Hollywood, they'll go, go to the military. And so we did, so more, quite often, as soon as we finished eating dinner, we would just head for the theater, and, and when that would go on, uh, then we'd uh, wait to see the movie. The most memorable movie there was uh, Ray Milan's Lost Weekend. Are you familiar with that movie at all? <laughs> well, it's about this guy who was an alcoholic. And he, he's drinking like crazy and all that sort of stuff. But as soon as the movie ended, everybody said, man, oh, what this, let's go to the PX and drink. <laughs> so so after, the movie didn't deter him at all. We head for the PX and drink beer. <laughs> um, so... Uh... So after watching, so talking about life on the site, after watching um, testing of the bomb, uh, you, so you knew, you said, as you told your friends, it's going to end and the war's going to end in 30 days. So you, you, yeah. so you knew oh, when, yeah, yeah. when it was going to um, be deployed. What, obviously you were happy to see the war end. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people were. Yeah. What, were your, what were your thoughts about this type of weapon being used for the first time. I know there was discussion of using it in Germany, but since the war had ended sooner, yeah. um, it was yeah, they, 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 the discussion in Germany wasn't too serious. They, they discussed mm -hmm. it, but uh, <laughs> Germany's too crowded, you know. I mean, the country of Europe is just a little too too small. And so, uh, after <laughs> the interesting thing is, on several different occasions, I would talk in the other events, you know, and they'd ask what you did, and I said, well, they helped make the damn bomb. You know, one guy said, man, I'll tell you, you're glad you made it, because we were training for the invasion of Japan. And, uh, and another guy I know, he drew attack, uh, flew attack bombers in Italy, and he said, we were getting ready to do the same thing over in Japan. So he says, you saved us all this trouble. <laughs> I said, be my guest. <laughs> So it worked out pretty good that way. And then, of course, after as soon as the bomb was dropped, uh, um, it wasn't well known, but they didn't have another bomb ready, but they could have had. They were preparing. Uh, they were making these containers that could keep the hot stuff in. And one of the guys that we know real well, he says he's worked in a machine shop, and he says, you know, they got a, we got an order for several hundred of these containers, so I guess we're going to make several hundred more bombs. <laughs> but, but we never did. <laughs> but you had the means. Or, but, huh? yeah, you had the means to. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it just takes a little time to get all the stuff together. To, but, uh, so, but anyway, they, they were ready to get some more. They probably should have got a few more and would have cleaned the island of Japan right off the map, you know. <laughs> but, so, so what were, I mean, the first time this, this type of you know, nuclear weapon was used. Yeah. What, what were your thoughts of, upon how this would affect the world? Uh, how it would affect the United States' role? Um, what, what did you think at the time? We got enemies. Kill them. Get rid of them. And then they'll, 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 they'll learn. And it took the Japanese a long time, but they finally learned. That's why nobody had any qualms about the bomb at all. And uh, if we got a good weapon, we'll use it. And so that's what we did. So I, I didn't have any qualms about it. The bomb dropped, the big one dropped, killed 40,000 people instantaneously. Another 40,000 
died shortly thereafter. Did I have any qualms? Not a one. I mean, the fact that two were used, I think, uh, says a lot. Says a lot about the aggressor, uh, or not the you know our opponents. The fact that we the two were employed. Yeah, but you um, see, the opponents didn't know how many we had. See, neither right. did the Russians. Nobody, nobody knew how many bombs we had, and so we wanted to show them there's more than more than one. So that boom, and a week later, boom again. <laughs> how long is this going to continue on? You know. Right, right. So, um, so after. So you you still stayed in the in the army after the bomb was used and through the end of the war until um, March of forty six, correct? Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, yeah, we. Uh, yeah, right after the bomb was dropped, we, we started my group, the deep at the DP site, was kind of broken up because they were not going to have no more assembly. So then, I was sent out to S site, being an engineer and. Uh, I worked at an S site in the engineering department, where we, well, we d devised things like the uh, uh, production line for explosives and th so like that. And I did that up until March, and then I was discharged. But I figured, what am I going to do the rest of the year? I might as well come back here. So I did. I went home and leave, and then I came back and I worked as a civilian, doing the same job I did before as a, as a, as a GI but in the engineering group. And two things I remember specifically, I designed a wagon uh, out of tubular aluminum, about two inches in diameter, and a wagon for hauling high explosives from one end to some department to another, something like that. And then I also designed a production line for the uh, high explosives. And uh, so, so that, that was, and then the other engineering things that came along, but those are the two main things that I remember. And I did that till about December of the year, and then that's when I left and went home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Oh, we had a good time. Of course, when you come back and work as a civilian, it's a little better time. In the first place, I had a better place. I had a room. Instead of being in a barracks with a bunch of guys, they, they had a sort of barracks where they had rooms in it. And so I had, I had a room there. So that, that, that made life a little better right there. I would imagine. So, um, so after working with the Army, you only had a little bit left of college that just before you were about to finish, and then you ended up getting deployed. So then you went and finished up, correct? Yeah. After, right. um, so you finished in 47. Um, and you worked for General Electric. Yeah. But the interesting thing I was, I started off the class, you know, and it's just like I've never been away. I've been away for almost two years from school. You just go to class, you know, hello, everybody. Because you know, there's a different bunch of guys in the class now. Right. And the professor made some acknowledgement, you know, that I was back. And so we finished up. But the interesting thing was I picked up some enough credits that um, when I went to uh, North Carolina State that I only needed five more credits to graduate. And uh, they, I think I needed 140 credits to graduate. I only needed five more because I get credit. So that's when I took a couple of ridiculous courses like anthropology and stuff like that. Just, just, just for the hell of it, the f fun course. That I call them. After working on the bomb, yeah, I, think, that's right. I, think, so, I think your mind deserves some downtime. <laughs> yeah, and then, then we grad, then when I graduated, you get these the different job offers. Uh, I remember I got about four or five job offers, you know, engineers, pretty good demand in those days. And, and, and uh, I, picked the, I picked the one from General Electric, but I only picked that after I, uh, I went up to the school once and I talked to a guy that I knew. And he was telling me about one of his friends that took this job at General Electric as a test engineer. And as a test engineer, you work on different jobs for three months at a time, and you can pick your jobs you go you want, you know, and just to get the feel of the company and what kind of work you wanted to do. So uh, I said, thought it was a pretty good deal. I said, well, if that's what they do, then I think I better take up their offer. So that's what I did. I accepted the GE offer, and, and I went to work. First, first I worked in Bridgeport, Connecticut, working on mercury switches. Mm. Then I went to Trenton, New Jersey. Now Trenton was a good place because a bunch of uh, guys from co uh, different colleges all around the country that came, came there. And, and we, we had a good time. We did a good job working on uh, dishwashers and dryers and things like that. 
But that, that was a good time because there were a fun-loving bunch of college guys there. <laughs> and a couple of the guys I remained, you know, acquainted with for many years afterwards. But then after Trenton, I went to, uh, let's see, I go to Erie, Pennsylvania, I think, yes. The way I worked on locomotives. I think it was that's the photograph that you saw in a locomotive. I worked in electric uh, locomotives. And then I went to Schenectady to work on small motors. Yeah, everybody more, more or less had to go work on small motors because of General Electric. But, at General Electric. but then I found out that they had this program, a patent program, where you'd work in the, uh, during the day and then at night, at night you go to law school. And, and General Electric would pay half of that in law school. So I applied for that and, you know, interviewed and I got it. I went down there and, and uh, of course, the thing was that I had the GI Bill. So it really didn't cost me anything. It didn't cost GE anything either. <laughs> so I had enough time with GI Bill to go all the way three years through law school. And you went to George Washington right here in uh, D.C. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. yeah. So what, what, what inspired you to go to law school? And what? What inspired you to go to law school? Well, the engineering, I thought, was pretty interesting, but I wasn't that keen on, you know, being an engineer. And then the, the law is kind of interesting, and then especially with patents, you know, because the patents, you had to have a technical background of some sort. And so uh, I said, well, I'll try it. And uh, I, I, I did. I just... Want to do a little more than just being a plain engineer, but at the same time, I wanted to be able to use my technical uh, knowledge and skills whatever I acquired. So law school was the answer. <laughs> Very nice. We're uh, at the end of our program here. Is there anything, uh, when you look back at your service in the Army, your work as an engineer, and how that you know eventually parlayed into your later career with General Electric and um, even even into just uh, the company that you eventually started. How what? Do you, uh, you eventually started um, a, or you're the president of a small company. Right oh now, yeah, correct? yeah. Want to go into that? Do you want to talk about that as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I think it, if you want to do that, let's uh, jump back a while. I I work uh, with the patents. Um, uh, I worked for the Navy Department at one time in Washington. I spent about a, uh, almost a year working in the Navy Department. Uh, and then I got a job with a firm of Toolman and Toolman. The Toolman firm was very interesting because they're from Dayton, Ohio. And the senior Toolman used to be the patent attorney for the Wright brothers. And so uh, I never met the old man, but uh, one of the colleagues in there did. So I worked, I worked there for about 10 years. But during that 10 years, he had an office in Frankfurt, Germany, and asked if I wanted to go to Frankfurt. So at that time, I was married, and I said I didn't even knew I didn't even have asked my wife because I know she'd go like that. So, <laughs> so I came home and said, well, we're going to Germany. Okay, let's go. So we lived in Frankfurt for two years, and while I was there, I was uh, uh, going around the, uh, well, I did a lot of traveling around because one thing, I was bluntly speaking, trying to drum up some business. And, and then I, we did already have German clients, and so we visited all the clients and all that. But it's very interesting, and I, when I start talking to some of these guys that were, had been in the German army, <laughs> and so we exchanged stories back and forth. The best one I heard was that we had this one guy. He was a kind of an academic type. And uh, uh, he was telling me that he was drafted the German army and he finds himself out on a, in a pillbox on a beach in Normandy with three or four other guys. And, they, and they're all in the same category. They're all students, these guys. They, they, they couldn't care less about the war. They're all students. So they, they said, okay, well, we see the first guy uh, come on the beach, down on the beach, we run out and throw up our hands and run out and don't fire a shot. And that's what they did. He says, as soon as they saw the first Americans, they ran out of the pillbox and all surrendered and that was the end of the war for them. <laughs> but a few other war stories like that. I talked to some of the guys, it was pretty interesting. Interesting to see it come 
full circle that you had the opportunity to talk to Germans. Oh, yeah, well, Germans I, that, I appreciated that. Yeah. And, and going around and uh, put it bluntly, look and see what damage we wrought on the Astra. <laughs> There's still quite a bit of damage, and a lot of those places weren't uh, built up then. And it, so, any last thoughts on, on your contribution to, uh, to one of the most dramatic weapons that really shaped the 20th century? I mean, yeah. it's. Well, I'm just proud of it. I worked on the thing, and especially in the final assembly group. I was, I don't there must be about maybe 20 guys or so in our final assembly group, and we had this thing sort of packing, you know, assembling the whole thing, and then shipping it out. And uh, I always thought that was great. That's. I'm proud of that. Definitely made your mark on history and on the bomb as well. <laughs> Hopefully you're finally yeah, you signed it too. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Well, see, what happened? They did paint over it, but, you know, uh, on the tail, they didn't. And somebody signed guys. some guy signed it on the tail fin because actually I saw a picture on the Internet of somebody's signature on the tail fin. And one of the guy's names was Di Sabatino. Now, I recognize the name because he's a lieutenant that was with us at Los Alamos. So he probably was shepherding the bomb along to go out there. Well, sir, uh, it's been an honor. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your contribution. Um, Edmund Daskowitz worked on as a U.S. Army veteran of World War II, worked on the Manhattan Project, and would later go on to study law and uh, work for General Electric. He, um, we're honored to have him with us today, honored to thank him for his service. I'm Megan Maggi, and this is Veterans Chronicles.